even though we're not a large crowd this morning, you're still going to get both barrels. <laughs> After I go to the Lord in prayer, we'll be reading from John chapter 10. Our Heavenly Father, again, I, I lift up those of our church family who are having difficulties this morning. So many with illnesses and problems like that, some traveling. Lord, pray that you bless them. Be with them and strengthen and bring them back to us as soon as possible. But I ask now, as always, that those who are here would have open and receptive hearts to your word. This morning, Father, your word should actually really touch our heart, as it always does. I pray your Holy Spirit would enlighten it for us. We need to see these great truths that are here, and this is a magnificent portion of Scripture. I know that it is a holiday weekend, and I know that maybe some thoughts are turned to picnics and family outings and visitations and that sort of thing, but I just ask that for these next few moments that we could turn aside from those things and focus on our Savior. Without Jesus, we have nothing, and He gives us everything. So open our spiritual ears that we may hear and our spiritual eyes that we may see and a heart to take your word not only into us that hold it, but to use it out in the world so that others could come to the Savior. And I do pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. John chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. Jesus is speaking here. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then Jesus said unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. There are four, four points this morning, and I hope that doesn't scare you, rather than three. We're going to find the door into the sheepfold, the door of the sheep, the door, and the good shepherd as we go through this message. If we were walking the earth at the same time that Jesus Christ walked the earth, there was something that we would see in almost every town. It was a public sheepfold. It was, you know, there's still some in that area today, but it's public. And what I mean by this is that in the evening, the shepherds would bring their sheep in the particular town and they would take it to that sheepfold and they would put their sheep in charge under the charge of a porter who would keep them under watch at night. Those uh, shepherds were actually doing, there was entrusting their sheep to the porter who kept the sheep and then the shepherds would go home for a night's rest now this was the time of the year when they bring them in that they the other times of the year they would keep them out in the fields but then early the next morning the shepherd would get up and he would identify himself to the porter and then he would let the shepherd the porter would let the shepherd come through the door to get his sheep now i want to try to explain that maybe i didn't do a really good job but if you want to, and something we understand today, it's a sheep hotel. And there goes a, a porter is at the door. 
to keep the sheep in there and safe. So we want to think with the physical in our mind, we want to see what Jesus is talking about here. What's he speaking about? Now, first off, remember, he is talking to the religious leaders. He is talking to Israel. And that's important for us to remember here. That is your primary focus. Does it apply to the church? Yes, it does. Later, remember, the church at this point is still a mystery. First thing I want to look at, the door into the sheepfold. Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth in some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. First thing I want you to see this morning is what is represented represented by the sheepfold. It's Israel. That sheepfold is the nation of Israel. Remember, Jesus says over in Matthew 15, 24, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as we go through this portion of Scripture, we'll come back to that in this chapter 10. We'll come back to that again. But he's identifying Israel. He, he's what he's talking to right here. We need to remember that. Make that clear distinction between Israel and the church. And this is the birthday of the church. But Jesus is talking now to those religious leaders. So Jesus makes a clear and very distinct statement by telling the religious leaders, he came in by the door. The Lord's making a strong point of telling them this, that anyone who doesn't come in by the door, tries to come in any other way, breaks in, whatever, is nothing more than a thief and a robber. That's a powerful claim the Lord's making right here. And I think many people might miss it. Jesus Christ came in by the door. That is, he came in legally. What I'm trying to explain to you here is Jesus came into this world in fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah's first advent, his first coming. Jesus Christ fulfilled it all. It's important that we also see that the Lord Jesus Christ came in under the law, as we're told in Galatians 4, 4, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. You know, sometimes we forget because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are in our New Testament. You realize they're Old Testament books? They're under the law. It tells us the story of Jesus Christ walking on this earth, but they stop short of telling us about the church. Yes, they're new to us, but we still have to remember we're under the law here. You know, we know that Jesus came from the line of David, according to prophecy. We're told that in Luke chapter 1, that he comes from that line. He was born in Bethlehem, according to Micah 5, 2 prophecy. Jesus was not only from the line of David, but he was born of a virgin in accordance to what we're told in Isaiah 7, 14. At the time of Jesus' birth, he was a rod out of the stem of Jesse, Isaiah 11, 1. Now, let me give you an interesting point about this. And I think here again, many people miss this point, and it's important. At the time our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, came into this world in that physical body, the royal line of David had dropped back to the position of common peasant. Now, we have a promise that there would always be a king from the line of David to sit upon the throne of Israel. And he is, that's Jesus Christ, and he will. But at this point in time, Pilate's the governor. Herod is the king. He's not of the line of David. He's not even Jewish. There's the, the line of David has just disappeared as far as royalty at that point. And if you recall, Jesse, the father of David, had been what? A farmer in Bethlehem. And as a matter of fact, he raised sheep. Isn't it interesting? Sheep, of all things, we're talking about this morning. His son David had that anointing oil poured on him and, and the, line, the kingly line of Israel became in effect. It was a while after he was anointed before he actually became king, but he was the king. And his son, and his son down the line. But while Jesus here, by that time that Jesus was born, he is just a branch out of the stem of Jesse, the peasant. 
He didn't come as king of Israel, even though he is the king. While walking here on this earth, Jesus was simply looked at as the son of a carpenter. He wore a carpenter's robe, not the royal attire of the king. Jesus was simply a peasant, an offshoot of Jesse. Amazing when you look at it, isn't it? But yes, remember, Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And one day he will assume that position, rightfully so. By the time he walked the earth, he walked the earth as a humble peasant. You remember, you need to pay temple tax or you better go fishing, catch a fish out with something in his mouth. He was a humble peasant. What money they had, Judas carried it. You don't know how much Judas stole of that. But it's actually wonderful, isn't it? When you see how prophecy is fulfilled, it makes things come into focus for you. Jesus is the Messiah. And when we see through all this prophecy fulfilled, He came through the door the way He was supposed to. There has never been anyone else who could have had the credentials that Jesus Christ had. And no one else will ever come with those credentials. Anyone else making the claim of Messiah would have to come through a different way. They'd have to break in. They would be a thief and a robber. They wouldn't have the credentials that Jesus had. They wouldn't have the credentials of the Messiah. And they could not have come through the door. They would have to climb over the fence. Remember, in the last chapter, we spent a long time, I know, in that last chapter, the blindness, you know, they, they, Jesus healed that man of his blindness and the religious leaders excommunicated him. They put him out of the temple. The religious rulers at that point rejected Jesus Christ. John records that for us and he also says they, they're challenging him right now. Remember their response when Jesus was talking about these things, about being blind? They said, are we blind also? And Jesus made it clear as he possibly could, the fact that they were blind, spiritually blind. So Jesus presents his credentials to them. What a tremendous claim Jesus makes in this chapter. Israel is the sheepfold, and we're going to find out Jesus is the good shepherd. Now I want to read verse 3 once again. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he called his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. Well, who does the porter represent? If the sheepfold is Israel, who's the porter? The porter is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God came upon Jesus and everything that he did, he did it by the power of the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit who opened the ears of the sheep to hear his voice. Notice I said Jesus' sheep and his sheep have responded. This too ties in with the chapter we just finished over in chapter 9. The religious leaders, those rulers, they're spiritually blind. They're also spiritually deaf. They can't hear. You see, those leaders didn't hear Jesus' voice. But Jesus calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. The blind man heard Jesus call and he responded. Remember that? Simon heard Jesus call and the Lord changed him. He followed and changed him. He even changed his name to Peter Stone. Jesus calls James, Nathaniel, John, and Philip and they followed. Jesus stopped under that tree in Jericho and Zacchaeus was there followed him. Jesus calls his sheep by name and they know him and they follow him. I'm going to go down a rabbit trail for a minute here. I think this is important. When the Lord calls his own out of this world of the rapture, and it could be any time now, maybe in our lifetime, maybe not, but when he does, I truly believe that his call will be every believer's name. You're going to hear your name. Remember when he's at the tomb of Lazarus? Lazarus, come forth. And I think I'm going to hear him personally when they, Melvin, come on. That's incredibly wonderful. You're going to hear his name too. If he comes in your lifetime, you're going to hear your name called. That's a wonderful thing. 
Jesus knows my name and he'll call it. He knows your name. If you're one of his sheep, he's going to call you by name. You're going to hear it. You're going to go. You will hear your name in the shout and you're going to follow him. Jesus leads his sheep out of the sheepfold. He leads them out of Judaism. Remember the religious leaders had excommunicated that man who had been had his sight restored by Jesus. Jesus is now going to lead his sheep out of that, out of Judaism. And when he put it forth his own sheep, he goeth before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Remember the sheepfold was an enclosure where the shepherds put their sheep for the night and the porter was in charge of it. The shepherd would spend the night in his own bed and return the next morning to the sheepfold. All of the sheep are mixed together. You know, they weren't branded. They didn't have any markings. So it's an interesting question. How does the shepherd get his own sheep out from a flock? Of all these sheep, how does he going to get his out? The sheep hear him. The shepherd calls his sheep by name. The sheep don't have to be identified. They know the shepherd's voice. When the shepherd starts off over the field, his sheep come out of that sheepfold and they follow him. His sheep know him. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Jesus' sheep follow him because they know his voice. Think about this. When you, and I'm not all that, when you give out the word of God, Jesus is calling his sheep. Have you ever thought about that? When you tell somebody about Jesus, Jesus is calling his sheep. The Holy Spirit is the porter who does the opening and the sheep will hear. Jesus will lead his sheep out of the legal system and maybe out of a church where they're not being taught the word of God. Jesus will lead his sheep out of there. That sounds strange, doesn't it? Jesus will lead his sheep out of a church? Yes, he will. If by chance you get caught up in some false teaching, in some false religion, he will call you out of that church. Of course, we're stubborn. Sometimes we don't want to leave. But the one thing about it, if you hear Jesus' voice, Jesus' sheep will follow him. There's no way anyone can permanently fool God's sheep. It's sad but true that his sheep do get involved in cults and isms for a while. But his sheep will always recognize his voice. They'll recognize the good shepherd's voice. I want to tell you something extremely sad. It's really sad. There are so many preachers today who are afraid to stand up for the truth of the word of God. They don't want to offend anybody. They don't want to run anybody off. They don't want to make anybody angry. But when a man preaches the word of God, the sheep will hear it. It's true because the Lord said, my sheep hear my voice. And a stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. I know you can fool some of God's people some of the time, but I don't think you can fool God's people all the time. I've known believers that have been caught up into false, false things, and after a while they said, wait a minute, I'm not hearing the voice here, and they leave. And it's possible that some of God's sheep may think they hear Him, but eventually they realize they weren't really hearing from the Savior at all. They're not hearing His voice. Remember, Satan will try to imitate anything. Satan always puts just a little dab of truth in the middle of all his lies to pull you. That's why you need Bible study. That's why you need to sit under the Word. That's why you need to listen to the Word of God. Then when these people who have been maybe drawn in, when they hear the true teaching of God's Word, they respond because they know the shepherd. You know, I've been teaching the Word of God now for a good number of years. And I've seen that when Jesus' sheep hear His voice, they will follow Him. I used to do some worry about those who wouldn't listen to the message of God's Word. 
I've been, well, actually, not too long ago, I was really, what am I going to do? They don't listen. You know, I thought it was something wrong, something I was doing wrong, some shortcoming on my part. What am I doing wrong, Lord, that they won't listen to me? But you know, the Lord has placed on my heart not to worry about it. The reason some people don't hear the message is because they do not hear His voice. They are not His sheep. That's a sad statement, but it, you know, the Lord said, no, but it's not your fault. You preach the Word. They'll respond if they belong to Me. You keep preaching the Word, and eventually they will belong to you. Yeah, so whenever you find people gathered together who eager to hear the Word of God, you know what? You know they're His sheep. If they're eager, they're hungry for the Word, they're His sheep. Verse 6 says, This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not the things they were, which He spoke unto them, which is normal. Interesting here. If you do a Greek study, uh, parabola is the Greek word for parable, but this is paramia used here, which means an allegory or a metaphor. It's interesting, if you study the Gospel of John, how many uh, Jesus parables are recorded in John? One, two, three, anybody know? None. Interesting, and so it's a little, I think if you use the word here, metaphor, it might play better. And he uses others in here. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. It's understood these aren't parables. They're figures of speech. And they're used by the Lord so that we more, more clearly understand something about God. Using the physical to demonstrate the spiritual. Because see, we're kind of slow. We need things that we can see. Things we can put our hands on to be able to understand the things we don't. So the use of these are just intended to shine light on the subject that we are supposed to be seeing. So this verse could be could read, this metaphor spoke Jesus unto them, or this allegory. The religious leaders didn't understand what Jesus said. They never understood his parables. Why? As he had already told them, they're spiritually blind, they're spiritually deaf. Mm -hmm. Over in Matthew 13, 9, the Lord said, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Believe it or not, it's possible to have ears and yet not hear. There are people who hear all right when they're dealing with things of the world, but they don't hear the Word of God at all. You see, people, we, don't, we hear what we want to hear a lot of times. You know, if, you know, I'm guilty of this. If I'm watching the ball game and Dad asks me something, I may not pick up on the question right away. I have a, I'm focusing on one thing that I sure wish it hit, but I don't hear like, and that's what we are. The word, we think we hear the world, but yet we don't hear Jesus all the time. The important issue here is hearing the word of God. This important difference is found in Matthew 13, 14, where Jesus quoted Isaiah, by hearing you shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see it and shall not perceive. That is what we're looking at with the religious leaders. That's what we're looking at here. They don't hear Jesus. They hear words. That's all. But they don't hear what He's saying. So I'm going to look at the door of the sheep now. We look at the door into the sheep. Let's look at the door of the sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Jesus is going to give us another spiritual lesson here. Jesus talked about the door into the sheepfold. Now he takes it a bit further and he says that he is the door of the sheep. Another one of those great I am's of John. It's important for us to see that Jesus is the door for those coming out of Israel. He's the door. Remember the religious leaders had just caught that blind man and they had cast him out of the, the temple, the synagogue, out of the sheepfold. They had just cast him out. You know, out of business, out of friendship, out of religion. Immediately after he was cast out, the Lord came to him and revealed himself to him. You remember that? The moment Jesus revealed himself to that man, our Lord became the door for that man. I think I told you the story a while back about John Hancock 
who listened to a sermon about the door. I think it last maybe it was last week, but I can't remember. He heard it and he, he couldn't John Witherspoon's sermon and he couldn't grasp it until he got home and <coughs> he put the key in the lock and opened the door and he I can go in and out and hit him what he's talking about. When that man, that blind man who had been blind, accepted Jesus Christ as the Son of God, at that point, that man was brought out of the sheepfold and he followed Christ. This is the second great truth that the Lord is stating in this chapter. Our Lord will state the same principle over in John 15 where it says, I'm the true vine and ye are the branches. In the Old Testament, of course, the vine pictured the nation of Israel. What Jesus says there, he is no longer, is no longer the connection with the nation of Israel, but the relationship with him, which is joining the branches to the vine. You know, they must come out of the ritualism and come to Jesus. It's so easy to get hung up on ritualism and tradition that you miss the truth. Jesus clearly states that He is the door of the sheep. Keep in mind now, Jesus is talking to the religious leaders, and by the way, some of them did come through that door after the resurrection. We're told that some of them did, some of the priests believed. Now let's just talk about the door. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I'm come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. Jesus is the way, and He's the only way, the only door of salvation. The door is such a simple concept for us to see. There's no one here, even the youngest one here this morning knows what a door is. Jesus is the way out for you, and Jesus is also the way in for you. Isn't that what a door does? The door is the exit point for you. It's also the entrance point. Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. The thief, the devil, and all his followers, they come to steal and to kill and to destroy. And this is a test that you can apply to any church, and believe me, just because the name is church doesn't mean that they actually believe in Jesus Christ, that they're actually giving the gospel. But this is a test you can apply to the church, a religious organization, a radio show, a television show, doesn't matter. The question is this, is it a religious racket? By that I mean, is somebody getting rich from this? Where is their God? Is their God their pocketbook or their God Jesus Christ? Look at the type of organization and you compare it with the good shepherd who came to save sinners and to give his life that we might have abundant life. That is the test that you use against any organization. What's important to them? I'm going to have a little brief review here before I move on. The door to the sheepfold. Sheepfold is the nation of Israel. Jesus will lead His sheep out of Judaism, out from under the legalistic system, out from under the rabbinical system that has been devised by them. The door of the sheep. Jesus is the door for those coming out of Judaism. Just like that excommunicated man had been because he had been healed from blind and He's called them out. He's called us out. Acts 2.40 Save yourselves from this untoward generation and the door there in verse 9 jesus christ is the door for both jew and gentile he is the door of salvation freedom to go in freedom to find pasture is a liberty that you find with the sons of god in jesus christ so that takes us to the good shepherd we've looked at that door pretty completely i'm the good shepherd the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Jesus is both the door and the shepherd at the same time. Now you might be thinking, how can he be both? How can he be the door and the shepherd at the same time? Well, I think it'll help you 
A lot of times we get confused because we don't look at the situation of the time. We need, you know, when you interpret scripture, you do it historically, grammatically. Histor we need to look at how things were done in those days. If we look at, again, if we look at the sheepfold of the time, if you were standing outside that sheepfold, there was no door there on hinges. There was no lock, no padlock of any kind. The man, the porter who was guarding the sheep, he slept across the doorway. You see, all of a sudden, the porter, the guard of the sheep, is also the door. For the sheep to get out during the night, they would have to go over him. If you walk by there in the middle of the night, you'd see the porter probably snoring in the doorway. See, Jesus goes beyond being the door. He's also the good shepherd. Jesus is the one who stays in the doorway. Jesus is the door which opens to eternal life. Jesus is the door of the one who protects his own. Jesus is also the good shepherd. Now let me give you something else to meditate on. Jesus, the good shepherd, is also called the Lamb of God. So how can Jesus be the Lamb of God and at the same time be the Good Shepherd? Oh, I'm, try, I'm, try, I'm trying to make you think. You know why I do that? Because it's the same thing Jesus did. He tried to make people think by asking questions. I know it sounds like a mixed metaphor that He is the Lamb and He is the Shepherd. But let me say without any doubt, it's one of the most glorious truths of Scripture. He is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Our Lord Jesus Christ came down to this earth and identified Himself with us who are sheep. And in fact, He is the shepherd also. The fact that He became the Lamb emphasizes something very important for us to see. The humanity of Jesus Christ. The fact that He is the Good Shepherd emphasizes the deity of Christ. <coughs> Again, we see Jesus was totally man and is totally God. I hope you caught what I said. He was totally man. He is totally God. Because He always has been God, He always will be God's present tense. Jesus alone is worthy. And Jesus alone is able to save you. And no human being can do that. Therefore, without any doubt, Jesus is God. The Lord Jesus Christ has a threefold relationship to His flock which is known today as the church because they've come out of that sheepfold. First of all, he is the good shepherd and he defines the good shepherd in verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Now, he's also the great shepherd. Ah, and we read that in that magnificent benediction of Hebrews 13, 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep. Just read Psalm 23. But wait, there's more to the picture. He's the good shepherd. He's the great shepherd. And in the future, we'll see that he is the chief shepherd. In 1 Peter 5, 4, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of, crown of glory that fadeth not away. We read about that. We sang about the rapture a little bit ago. Peter says, when that chief shepherd shall, shall appear, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Now take note that unlike Jesus, the hireling does not care for the sheep. You know, the founders of most of the world's religions I don't know why you put work. If there's a founder on this earth, it's, you know, they're really, they don't care for their followers. The cult leaders of the day only desire to be made rich off of the people who follow them. And this is in total contrast to the Good Shepherd. If you want to compare the leader of these churches, these isms and schisms today, compare them to the Good Shepherd who gave his life for the sheep. And he protects his own. Jesus didn't ask you to give him anything but your heart. 
your faith. He didn't say, go to the bank and draw out so much money. While we were yet sinners, He cried, died for us. He cried for us too, didn't He? As He's walking up to the tomb of Lazarus, Jesus wept. He didn't weep because His friend was dead. He wept because He looked out at the people that were there that day who were not believing in Him. And He knew those who would never believe. He wept at their lost state. And He wept because He had to bring Lazarus back from paradise into this world of sin. I'm the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. And the Father knoweth me. Even so, I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. But what a wonderful relationship that is. Jesus knows His sheep and Jesus' sheep know Him. Philippians 3.10 says that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. If we grasp the resurrection, you're going to grasp everything else. That's the reason if you look at, at the apostles, when they, when they write in the New Testament, when they talk about Jesus, they talk about the sacrifice, His death, burial, and resurrection. They never leave Him in the tomb because He's not in the tomb. To know Jesus Christ is to love Jesus Christ. And this is the third time that Jesus tells us His sheep know Him. He keeps telling us that. For you to know Jesus Christ is the most important thing of all. Everything else, and I mean everything else, is secondary. You see, it's time that we quit arguing about non-essential things. It's time for us to stop arguing about religion and about details and about ritual and about tradition. The important issue to know is Jesus Christ. We have to stay on that level. We have to stay in that straight line if you want to reach anybody. And I've told you many times before, when people start to feel that conviction, they're going to try to change course. They may be like the religious leaders and use ridicule and attack you, or they may say, well, let's talk about this. Let's talk about prophecy. Keep it focused on Jesus. Next this one. Do you hear His voice? Do you know the shepherd? There is no shepherd like this one. You know, David risked his life to save his sheep from a bear and from a lion. The son of David gave his life for his sheep. <coughs> do you hear his voice? If you do, will you follow him? And follow him today. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for this portion of Scripture. It is powerful. And we think about that great door, Lord Jesus Christ. It's a door through which we pass through and we see eternity before us. It's a door that calls us out of the sheepfold of this world, of religion, tradition, ritual. And the list goes on and on the door we pass and follow because we hear His voice and we follow Him for all eternity. Father, I thank You for those who have turned aside this morning. We have missed so many. I do want to pray for our church family again. I pray for Linda and her stomach problems she's having. Pray that would heal quickly. And for Norma and James, so many physical problems there. It is for Elizabeth and Clarence for Mike and that heart issue he's having, for Clayton and Kim as they're traveling this morning celebrating the dedication of a new grandchild, and Danny and Teresa traveling home, Virginia and Mary Frances and Frances and Bonnie and Grace. so many people, Lord, that need you to reach down, touch, heal, guide, direct, give safety to. And I know they hear your voice. And I pray that they hear your voice saying, come and rest, come to me, and they will follow. And that's my prayer for those here this morning. 
that they hear the voice of Jesus and follow Him wherever He may lead. Be with us this day, Father, to guide us, direct us, give us safety and bring us back again this evening that we may once again sit under Your Word and hear Your voice. And it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that I pray. Amen.